Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody to our colloquium of today. So today we have a very special colloquium. And uh, well, I think the quest to understand the nature of the universe as well as to find our place within the cosmic order is as all as human curiosity. Uh, the scientific advances occurred between 1900 and 1931, and that you will hear next, led to astronomers to drastically change their view of the universe. One, the value of the size of the galaxy increased by a factor of 10. Two, galaxies are systems beyond our galaxy. And three, radial velocities of galaxies reveal the expansion of the universe. The Great Debate is one of the most famous events that occurred uh, during that revolution. In 1920, Harold Shapley and Herbert Curtis debated over the scale of the universe, including whether the universe was composed of only one big galaxy. While Shapley and Curtis each had whole portions of the correct picture, but were wrong about other conclusions, both made points that fundamentally altered around our understanding and place in the universe. In this colloquium, Mariana Canodias will ex examine the scientific environment in which the 1920 event occurred, the background and the event and its participants. Vladimir Avila will review the most relevant advances in our understanding of galaxies after the acceptance of their existence and as external galaxies. Finally, Joel Primack will discuss other similar debates that could have being held from 1920, including the one that could be well be happening now. So who is who? Um, Dr. Cano Diaz is a conocid research fellow uh, at the Instituto de Astronomia at UNAM. She obtained her PhD degree um, at the Sapienza University of Rome. She studied a second major in history from the School of Philosophy and Letters at UNAM. Um, Dr. Vladimir Avila Ruiz is a full professor at the Instituto of, uh, of Astronomy at UNAM and level three of the National System of Researchers. Dr. Joel Primack is distinguished professor of physics emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He served as president of the Scientific Research Honor Society and publisher of uh, American Scientist Magazine from, 19, uh, from uh, 2018 to 2019. He was chair of the American Physical Society Forum on Physics and Society in 2019. And he received the American Physical Society Lilienfeld Prize in 2020. I hope you find today's colloquium enjoyable and entertaining. And please, Dr. Canarias, start. Yeah. Uh, you frozen. She frozen. Maybe have a problems with your connection. Uh, okay, you're ready. I think. Okay. Aldo, repeat again <laughs> the, the, the start. Mariana. Yeah, just, just invite Mariana again now. Uh -oh. She's still frozen. Sorry, that was my connection. Okay. Wonderful. That's it. You gonna start, Mariana? I start now. Okay. Just a second. Uh, I hope uh, everything will 
So as I said, I am going to uh, introduce the digital context of the gate. So as you will see, uh, the two astronomers that were active in the great debate were astronomers that were uh, working in California. So I think it's important to start with a context of that state of the United States of America in the global context. So the 20th century can uh, be thought by the relation with the So a uh, global scale conflict Oh, we are having troubles with the... Yeah, maybe maybe we should start with the second point, maybe, while she fixes her connection. Also. Let's see. Yeah, I, I think we're going to start with Vladimir. <laughs> with the, after the, <laughs> the, the great debate. Yeah. Okay, let me... So, I have to... But she not, she's not sharing now, yeah, the... the, the... No, she's, she's, now she's, you can share it. She went out. Okay. Okay, so it's a pity that. Uh, okay, what happened? I am sharing. Are you seeing my. No. What is happening? Share. We see your desktop, but not your, well, now we don't see anything. Quizá habrá que avisarle a Mariana que deje de compartir. Yeah, probably because he's... Ya le estoy avisando. Uh-huh. A hundred years ago, we didn't have these problems. Yeah. <laughs> Are you now... Yes. It's my... Yes. Okay. We okay. can see your representation. Go ahead. Like... Okay, let me put in the reproduce. Okay, so um, I will try to make a summary of uh, a century of uh, advance in this field, making an analogy uh, with, with bi biology. Uh, taxonomy, first taxonomy, the first thing to do when discovering a new type of entities is to attempt to classify them morphology. In this sense, morphology is the most immediate characteristic. Uh, the observed nebula at that time presented a great diversity of morphologies and studies until the 20s, could not even distinguish between galactic and extragalactic ones. The idea was to find a classification system that helps to reveal an order in the properties of the extragalactic nebula. Genes proposed a classification under the hypothesis of an evolutionary sequence. From a small, young, early, elliptical shaped nebula, to old, late, a spiral nebula, hence the name of early and late type galaxies. In, uh, in 1924, as you know, Hubble announced his famous determination of distance to M31 nebula based on surface. M31 is far away. It is, the gal it is a galaxy itself. This was the triumph of the Iceland universe theory. Immediately, Hubble started the taxonomical study of this extragalactic nebula in the 1926, and in the 1926, he proposed the famous tuning fork to die known as the Hubble morphological sequence. He abandoned the idea of an evolutionary sequence, but kept the genes early and late type designation. As more powerful telescopes appeared, finer galaxies were discovered by extending the sequence to SC, uh, SM, irregulars, and dwarf galaxies. Uh, uh, as, uh, as well as adding more morphological details to the classification, such as middle bars, rings, etc. Even the Vaculus proposed a whole morphological vo volume for that. Uh, regarding the luminosities uh, and sizes, in the 20s, 30s prevailed the Shapley's large 100 kiloparsec size of for our galaxy. And it was thought that the later the type, the larger the galaxy. In the 50s and beyond, it was realized that ellipticals are very luminous but compact, while later types are less luminous but with extended disk. In the 80s, 90s, it was possible already to establish a parallel morphological uh, classification for dwarfs, the most abundant galaxies in the universe. The big question that emerged is whether the Hubble sequence describes a physical systematicity of galaxies. It seems that yes. In its maximum simplification, the Hubble sequence can be understood 
as a sequence of the spheroid to disk ratio. These, tos, these two components uh, are physically very different. As you know, spheroids are supported by velocity dispersion, have mostly old stars, are gas poor and quiescent. Disks are rotational supported, have stars of all age, have gas and form stars actively. Uh, to inquire about the origin of the Hubble sequence, whether it is by nature or nurture, information is required on the internal properties of galaxies and their correlation, that is, the an anatomics. So let's go to the anatomical studies of galaxies. Uh, the question is, what's the composition of galaxies and the relation among these components? To find, uh, uh, to find out uh, these and these set galaxies in detail, multi-wavelength observations beyond the optical were necessary. After the 40s, the new radio telescopes allowed to study gas, with infrared, infrared observations after the 80s, all the stellar populations and dusty star-forming regions were studied, while energetic phenomena and very hot gas were discovered with UV, X-ray, and gamma-ray satellite, satellite missions. As the result of all these studies, we learned that galaxies are made of stellar populations of different age, metallicities, and kinematics, a complex interstellar medium in different phases, active galactic nuclei, which provide a source of energy apart from the stars, and dark matter, the invisible component that gravitationally, uh, as you know, confine galaxies. Let's see in more detail each one of these components. Uh, stars uh, are the cells of galaxies. Uh, in the 40s, Bade already noted that in the galaxy, there are two well-defined stellar populations, POP1 and 2. In the 50s, 60s, the stellar evolution theory is consolidated. This together with empirical and theoretical libraries of stellar atmospheres and a, a proposal for the initial mass function allowed us to model the evolution of a single burst and calculate the integrated spectrum of this single stellar population time by time. These works were pioneered by Tinsley and then by Serre and Brusual. Um, by proposing a star formation and chemical evolution laws, a, as you can see here, uh, bars of the stars can be triggered sequentially and the stellar population composed by all of these single populations can be calculated time by time. The multiple band spectrum of the composite stellar population is then obtained. For instance, at the present day, Inversely, given the observed spectrum, the stellar population synthesis allows us to decompose the multiple single stellar populations and infer the star formation and chemical evolution histories of galaxies, a method called fossil record, and that uh, this is method is actively used in the last 15 years. So what about regarding the interstellar medium? Already a century ago, astronomers realized about its existence by observations of dust lanes and dark and bright nebula. The idea was that of an homogeneous medium dominates. But in the 30s, 50s, astronomers learned about the properties and physics of photoionized regions around stars and understood that IGCN is complex. In the 50s and beyond, radio astronomy made it possible to study the neutral gas of galaxies, its spatial distribution and kinematics. Further, in the 70s, molecules were detected and the physics of molecular clouds started to be understood. Global interstellar mediums were developed according to the multiple, according to these models, multiple phase coexist and are closely related to stars and its feedback. Uh, now, as for AGNs, before the 50s, inertial emission lines were already known at the center of many galaxies, always as well as jets emerging from them. It was in the 50s that Ambar Sumian defined AGNs as powerful explosions at the center of galaxies. In the 60s, distant quasars were discovered. The, these are the most energetic machines in the universe. Andreldovich and Salpeter postulated that the source, the source of AGNs uh, is the accretion of gas toward supermassive black holes. Lindenberg predicted that most of galaxies should have in their center dormant supermassive black holes. And in the 90s, unified models to explain the phenomenology of AGNs emerged, and it was postulated that this galaxy component, in fact, plays an important role in galaxy evolution. So what about the dark matter. So since the Zwicky works in the theories, many observational studies assuming GR or Newtonian gravity find a huge excess of gravitational force. For example, the high velocity dispersion of galaxies in clusters and the nearly flat rotation curves of these galaxies. More recently, the technique of a strong and weak lensing uh, uh, 
definitely showed much more gravity than the one produced by the luminous matter. In the 70s, uh, from a theoretical point of view, uh, it was shown that these are very unstable. They need of a uh, stabilizing agent. And last but not least, uh, Silk showed that during the hot universe, any perturbation of galaxy or group scales is erased if it's made of, baryons, uh, of baryonic matter. All these observational and theoretical evidence loudly suggests the existence of a non-baryonic matter component that constitutes more than 90% of the mass of galaxies. Galaxies are submerged in dark halos that support them. Dark matter is like the skeleton of galaxies uh, in this sense. Uh, the internal properties of galaxies present, in fact, several correlations among them. Scaling relations are among the tightest ones. The luminosity or stellar mass of early types correlates with their velocity dispersion. This is the famous Faber-Jackson relation. And in the case of late type galaxies, the correlation is with their rotation velocity, the tally feature relation. More recently, a tight correlation between the supermassive black hole and the asteroid mass was found. Uh, and in the last years, it was found a nonlinear correlation between hello, between hello uh, uh, mass and stellar mass using uh, weak gravitational lensing or semi-empirical approach. Halos of about 10 to the 12 solar masses uh, have around four times less variance than the average in the universe. The efficiency of galaxy formation seems to be low, and it is even, uh, and it is even lower for, for, for less and more massive than, than this 10 to the 12 halo mass. Evidence is this, the role of supernova feedback at the, at the low masses and AGN or an, and shock heating at the large masses of cluster sizes. So the above uh, already uh, immediately uh, suggests the necessity of studying the, phys the physiology of galaxies. So, so how do work galaxies? How is their metabolism? So the key studies were those aimed to connect the star formation rate with the gas density. At high relation scale, uh, at, uh, uh, at high relation scaling to the 1.4 power law was found, and its interpretation seems to imply self-regulated processes of star formation, at least in the disk. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, astronomers determined the key mechanism for galaxy formation at the global level. Reduced, uh, this mechanism reduced mostly to a struggle between gas radiative cooling and its heating by shock, supernova, and AGNs. In the last 20 years, many studies show it that the local global connection in galaxies is very relevant. The star formation uh, and its feedback, as well as supermassive black hole formation and its feedback, happen at the scales of parsecs, but their feedback affects, uh, may affect uh, galaxy scales or, or, or many kiloparsecs or even the world galaxies. This is an interesting example of cell physiology in, in galaxies, in fact. So, what about the next uh, uh, biological kind of studies, the, 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 the ecology? How are the populations, how are the population of galaxies distributed and how, are, how they, 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 they are related to the environment? Uh, since the Schechter seminal work, it has been established that the abundance of galaxies slowly decreased with luminosity or mass to about 10 to, to the 11 solar masses and then decreased exponentially. Furthermore, the early type galaxies dominate at high masses, while uh, galaxies less massive than the Milky Way uh, are mostly of uh, late types. With the completion of large galaxy surveys, it was possible to, uh, already in, in our uh, century, it was possible to establish revealing population patterns. The galaxies present a bimodal distribution with a strong accumulations towards low and intermediate uh, masses of blue, this is the color, the uh, blue start forming and late type galaxies. And another uh, uh, accumulation towards larger masses of red, passive, and early type galaxies. The transition region between these two populations is, is very sparsely populated. This is the color, the green valley. So what about now the spatial, uh, the spatial uh, distribution of galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe trace, traced by them? Before the 70s, it was not yet clear uh, the large scale structure of the universe, look, how the large scale structure of the universe looked like. There was some evidence of supercluster, but in the 70s and 80s, the Soviet group led by Inasto and groups like those of Pali in the West, studying the 3D distribution of clusters and bright galaxies, 
concluded that there are walls, filaments, and huge voids. Galaxies and clusters are arranged in a sort of cosmic web. The statistical quantification of the spatial distribution of galaxies and their large scale motion, worked by Peebles and others, showed that the clustering of galaxies increase at the smaller scales. Uh, already uh, in this century, the complexity of very large and homogeneous galaxy surveys, uh, sorry, the completion of very large and homogeneous galaxy surveys confirmed definitively the cosmic web, analog for an accurate quantification of the large scale structure in the universe. Furthermore, since the 80s, it is known that the more dense the environment, the larger the fraction of early type quasi galaxies. Uh, this and, and the fact that merging galaxies were shown to drastically change the initial properties suggest that the Hubble sequence partially can be due to nurture. So at this point, we come to, the, to a climax, the, gener the genetics of galaxies. How do they form and evolve? Actually, the first attempts to treat the galaxies as evolutionary objects date back to the seminal work of Egan, Linden Bell, and Sandage 62, the monolithic and quick collapse of gas cooling spheres. Uh, uh, then expansions of this scenario were made in the 70s, considering angular momentum, star formation triggering, and its feedback. Later, it was proposed that galaxies may grow rather bottom up by, by mergers. Uh, however, there was a lacking uh, in, in the understanding of the initial conditions of galaxy formation. To the end of the 70s appeared the seminal paper by White and Rees, uh, where these initial conditions are given by the perturbations from which emerge hierarchically the dark matter halos. And these halos capture and cool gas to form inside them the galaxies. So to arrive at a genetic understanding of dark halos requires the cosmological context. I think Joel will elaborate more on, 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 this, on this aspect. Simply to say that in the 80s and, 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 and 90s, the cold dark matter cosmological scenario based, based on GR, Hubble expansion, Big Bang theory, inflation, and the gravitational paradigm was consolidated. Thanks to the contributions of uh, researchers as Peebles, Blumenthal, Primark, White, Frank, among others. From quantum fluctuations uh, in this scenario, uh, from quantum fluctuations, uh, we go to the CMBR and isotropies that are observed. And from this CMBR and isotropies, uh, we pass to the formation of galaxies. This is uh, the whole scenario of galaxy formation and evolution in the cosmological context. Uh, the terrific advance in astronomical instrumentation and observations allowed us to see evolution in action, that is the phylogenetics. Since the 90s, the CMBR and isotropies were studied in detail. The genetic code of cosmic structures is imprinted on them. On the other hand, with the deep uh, fields of the Hubble Space Telescope, we could study galaxy populations up to redshift 10, that is 13.3 uh, giga years ago, roughly. Galaxies really do change. Uh, and and, and, and at, at early times, they were very different as today. The gap with the observed CMBR and the formation of the first stars and galaxies is called the, the, the dark age. Recently, we started to detect indirect signals from the end of this age uh, with observations uh, in, in radio. So uh, the great debate 100 years ago prompted the creation of a new field in science, the extragalactic astronomy. This field nicely integrates a stellar and interstellar medium astrophysics galaxy dynamics, high energy physics, particle physics, and cosmology. And our understanding of galaxies and the universe as a whole expanded is exponentially since then. So now the question is, are we on the verge of new great debates? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Vladimir. <clears throat> uh, let's see if Mariana now can uh, give her presentation. Mariana? Okay. Um. Yes, I think it's better now. I will share my screen. Oh, I was not with video. I realized it just now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'm so sorry for the connection problems. I will try to go quickly and, and, and see if I can make it to the end. So, when thinking about the 20th century, it is impossible not to relate it with the concept of war. 
right after its first decade, a global scale conflict exploded in 1914, just after a century of relative peace. Besides the Great War, important revolutionary movements were arousing while trying to break with old traditions and schemes. In particular, the United States of America was living this time in a different way. Even if it had a big pressure to join the global war, this country was enjoying being one of the top three world economies. And in particular, the state of California started its transition to a very modern state with the beginning of the century. Public infrastructure started to grow along with its population. In this context, California had a particular interest to develop science and technology locally, especially for the mining purposes, because uh, they, those were close, closely related with a possible economic growth. Very soon after, important observatories started to emerge, positioning this region of the world as a very important developer of the astronomical discipline. So now we are going to, uh, it is also important to situate ourselves in the context of the development of physics around the time of the great debate. So that is what we are going to see right now. 1887 is the year that is known to mark the beginning of the era of modern physics with the crucial results given by Michelson and Morley, which eventually put an end to the idea that the light needs a medium to propagate. Afterward, incredibly important results started to emerge. Radioactivity was discovered, the atomic components slowly started to reveal themselves. Planck inaugurated the century with the mind blowing idea that the energy is quantized. Not long after, Einstein will explain the photoelectric effect and postulate the relativity principle. In the astronomical world, in the beginning of the 1910s decade, early forms of the hertzsprung russell diagram started to emerge, which was fundamental. And Miss Henrietta Leavitt made a breakthrough discovery about Cepheids being standard candles to measure astronomical distances. More closely to the time of the great debate, De Broglie presented his ideas of the wave particle duality, which were corroborated experimentally not long after. In other words, the world of physical science was extremely exciting and vibrant at that time, as modern ideas of the physical world started to come in. So in order to move forward, we need to have a little bit of background about what was the idea behind this spiral nebulae. So that's what we're going to see now. The celestial objects that we now know as galaxies were coined as a spiral nebulae. This term was first used by Immanuel Kant back in the 18th century. A few of these objects had already been uh, observed or for more than a century ago, in particular by Herschel, which was fundamental. However, by the end of the 19th century, two burning questions about them still remain among the astronomers. The first one was, um, are these uh, spiral nebulae systems of the stars or are they masses of true nebulosity? The second question was, are these nebulae associated to the Milky Way or are they actually island universes? Let's take first a look on the evidence against the island universe theory. Let's, uh, it's important to make a distinction here, and is that back then there was no real distinction between planetary nebulae and spiral nebulae. Due to that, when Huygens in 1864 used an spectroscope to observe a planetary nebulae, he assumed that uh, he, he, he observed a spectra just like this, the one that I'm pointing at. So this spectrum corresponded to luminous gas, not stars. So he assumed that all of the nebulae uh, had to be the, had to have the same nature. Then Proctor realized that when analyzing the positions of the spiral nebulae from the Hershey's catalog, uh, there was a particular region of the sky in which he could not find this uh, this spiral nebulae. This uh, zone or region uh, uh, coincided with the galactic plane. This region started to, to get uh, to, to be coined as the avoidance region. Then in the 1880s, ANOVA occurred in Andromeda. Astronomers at that time thought that it was impossible that a stellar object was able to reach such luminosities. Of course, they didn't have the knowledge that we have now about stellar evolution. So if, uh, uh, if, if, if it was not a star 
who uh, uh, produced this nova, then it was impossible to think that Andromeda or this spiral nebulae was a stellar object or a stellar system. Also in the 1980s, uh, the spiral nebulae uh, were uh, used to revive uh, an old hypothesis given by Laplace, who suggested that the planetary system should form from a cloud of nebulous matter with a central sun. So what they thought is that the center of this spiral nebulae was a central sun, and this nebulosity matter, uh, it was the place where the, the planetary system was forming. However, by the end of the 19th century, there were two breakthrough advances uh, that, that were made. In 1898, Killer uh, announced that he started a program at the Lick Observatory and that he found thousands of observable nebulae, most of them spirals. This was astonishing because only half century before, only a dozen of them had been found. On the same year, Schneier observed uh, the, the spectra of Andromeda and he found dark lines over the continuum. Soon after, other astronomers started to corroborate the uh, observations uh, that, was, that were reported by Schneider. So let's take a look at the evidence that astronomers had at that time in favor of the island universe. There were not uh, many evidences, pieces of evidence, but there was one that was uh, strong, and that was exactly the uh, observations of the spectra of the spiral nebulae. What they saw was a spectrum like this one that indicated that these systems may ha had to have stars. So from that moment, the astronomers started to think, well, planetary nebulae have to have a different nature than the nature of the spiral nebulae. So this was a strong uh, piece of evidence and uh, that was actually important. So now that we have this background, we can go to the observational evidence that astronomers started to gather in order to try to understand more about this spiral nebulae. So in 1910, Ritchie uh, used uh, the Mount Wilson Observatory to take a uh, new plate and with those uh, new plates, he proposed that the spiral nebulae could be stars in the process of formation. Also in 1913, Slipher at Lowell Observatory uh, made also a very important discovery. And that is that he used uh, spectroscopic shifts uh, observed from, uh, from Andromeda to derive radial velocities of even 300 uh, kilometers per second. This is extremely relevant because as far as I understand, Slipher was the first one or the pioneer to use spectroscopy shifts in order to derive uh, velocities. This was an astonishing result because this velocity is, uh, the was the largest velocity ever measured for a uh, celestial object back at that time. In 1914, Wolf announced that he corroborated the Slipher results for even 15 more nebulae. Also in 1914, a astronomer called Harlow Shapley joined the Mount Wilson Observatory. When he did that, he was sure that he wanted to study uh, globular clusters. For those, he derived some distances that I put here. Some of them were very large, more than 30,000 parsecs. And that has to be contrasted with the size of the, of the galaxy that was thought at that time. The size estimated for the Milky Way at that time was around 6,000 parsecs. Later, in 1917, Stanford in the Lick Observatory uh, tried to research for a spiral nebulae in the plane of the Milky Way, but he was unsuccessful. Then, between 1914 and 1915, uh, another important thing happened, and that is that Lampland at the Lowell Observatory tried uh, announced that he found some evidences of internal motions in the spiral nebulae by comparing recent plates with old ones. Also, Cortis, another astronomer at Link, at, at Link uh, tried to do the same, but he found nothing. The point or the issue about internal motions will become very important for the great debate, as we are going to see now. Adrian van Manen was a Dutch astronomer that uh, joined the Mount Wilson Observatory in 1912. When he joined there, he was given a specific task, and that was to compare M101 plates in order to try to see if he could uh, uh, detect internal motions in this particular uh, spiral nebula. 
it's important to say that he was an expert uh, studying proper motions of the stars, not in Spiral Nebulae. So uh, he announced that he was able to detect uh, internal motions in this nebulae. However, when uh, if he converted the proper motions to rotational velocity, assuming a large distance, the velocities that he found could be as fast as a large uh, as a fraction of the speed of light, which seemed kind of uh, unbelievable. Of course, Feynman's uh, results were absolutely high impact. Genes, for example, use them in order to develop his evolutionary theory of, sp of spiral nebulae. He thought that these objects had weak tidal forces that acted on the gas clouds, and uh, that the matter started to escape at, at two antipodal points. That explained the spiral arms of the nebulae. At the end, these nebulae had to become globular clusters. Other astronomers were not so much uh, excited about Feynman's results, like Eddington, who uh, said that those uh, velocities were extremely large. Other astronomers, like Reynolds, thought that the velocities were high because, uh, in when compared with the field stars, because this spiral nebulae must be near to the center of our own galaxies. So, as you can see, Feynman's results were controversial from the beginning, but are absolutely high impact. Then another piece of evidence started to show, and that is that in 1917, ANOVA occurred in the spiral nebulae NGC 6946. That was observed by Ricci. Then the young astronomer Curtis uh, was motivated by this result, and he uh, started to look for other novae in other spiral nebulae. At some point, he suspected that he had found three possible spiral, uh, uh, spiral novae. Here is, uh, is an image uh, uh, by Cortis, actually. Then other astronomers started to look uh, for possible novae in old plates and in new plates. Uh, and one of them actually was a uh, uh, Harlow Shapney. Cortis perfected uh, a methodology that he developed in order to derive distances. And he uh, thought that the distances were actually quite large, as you can see here. Then. Now we can move on to the Great Debate. So the Great Debate was proposed by Hale, by Hale in 1919 as an, an evening in the National Academy of Sciences. And, and, and he, what he proposed was to have an evening to discuss one of two very interesting topics, either relativity or the island theory. Relativity was discarded quickly, and then the island theory remained. So now, what they had to do was to pick the two speakers that were going to debate that night. So the first person that was selected was Harlow Shapley. He was selected to speak in uh, against the island theory. Why? Well, maybe definitely it was because uh, in 1917, he uh, postulated his what it was called his big galaxy theory. That theory said that uh, globular clusters had to be subordinated systems to the Milky Way. And they are uh, distributed symmetrically in the poles. The galactic system had to have a specific center that was not near our sun, and that the diameter of the Milky Way uh, should be as large as 92,000 parsecs approximately. The mid-galactic region, uh, he said, is a, domain, uh, is a region that is do uh, dominated by enormous masses and gravitational forces. For this reason, the globular clusters are not fine there. Also, the spirals or the spiral nebulae keep out these avoidance zones, and nine times out of ten, they are rushing away from it. It is very important to say that Shapley used 11 cephates in the globular clusters that he observed when he arrived into the observatory in order to derive the uh, distances to these, clusters, uh, to this, to these uh, clusters. And he used this, uh, this, these distances in order to build his model of the big galaxy. Then on the other side, uh, it was the problem of finding the suitable person to speak in favor of the island theory. The first option, it was actually William Wallace Campbell. He was the league director. And in 1916, he developed his thoughts on the island uh, universe theory. He thought that actually the Milky Way could be a spiral nebulae a spiral nebula. Why? Well, 
because he observed that when uh, that the spiral nebulae that were uh, etched on had obscuring lanes. So if the, if the Milky Way is a spiral, then this may explain why uh, um, other spirals are clustering around its poles. Um, he thought that the evidence of the spectra of the spiral nebulae, even, if, even though if it was scarce, it was strong. So the spiral nebulae had to, ha had to be stellar systems. Also, he thought that the large velocities uh, that these systems had suggested that they have uh, large masses, with mean, what means that they uh, could host many stars. Also, he thought that Magallanic clouds seem to have spiral structure. That, and that was very important because for the Magallanic clouds, they were able to actually resolve individual stars. So it was plausible that other spirals may have stars, but that, they, that at that time, they simply cannot uh, resolve these individual stars because they were too far away. However, at some point, uh, they decided that uh, they were going to uh, pick Herbert Cortis in order to debate that big night. Why? Well, because during 1917, he published uh, three papers with, the idea, with his ideas of the island theory. He thought that the spiral nebulae were more likely to be systems in which stars are born rather than being a solar system in creation. He also thought that the velocities of the spiral nebulae were too high to be considered as bounded to the Milky Way. Uh, he also thought that the peculiar positions in the sky for the spirals avoiding this uh, galactic plane made possible to think that they were not part of the Milky Way. However, he had an argument against the island theory and that was that he, uh, for he it was not possible to find a clear center in these systems. So what happened in that big night? Well, uh, actually the debate was not as exciting as we, think, uh, as we may think. What uh, the historical records say is that Shapley did not use his time well, and Cortis was a very experienced speaker. So Shapley uh, spent lots of, uh, a lot of his time trying to explain what a light year was. And in the end, uh, he just scarcely touch the, uh, the, the topic about the island theory. What he uh, actually did was to um, explain why the distances that he uh, found to the globular clusters were correct. And if those distances were so uh, large, then that would explain uh, why uh, the Milky Way was the entire universe. The arguments that uh, also Shapley said that the uh, peculiar motions that the proper motions that uh, Van Manens uh, had derived needed uh, to be, uh, in order to be uh, physically plausi plausible, uh, that, that, sorry, that the, the proper motions that Van Manens had uh, uh, derived in order to be physically plausible needed that the, this, um, it needed that this spiral nebulae had to be close to the Milky Way. So they cannot be uh, extremely far away. So the argument given by Cortis is that uh, the Milky Way had to be at least 10 times smaller uh, than uh, what Shapley had derived. He uh, was not a strong uh, believer uh, of the Cepheids as good uh, estimators for the distance. He thought that the large velocities derived by Slipher uh, made uh, implied that the nebulae had to be uh, external uh, galaxies. Also the spiral novae, uh, if they, uh, he thought that the spiral novae had to be similar to the, to the, to the novae that we see in uh, our own galaxy. And the fact that they seem uh, fainter indicates that uh, the distance to this novae or to this spiral nebulae had to be so high. So as you can see, the great debate did not have a big conclusion on that night. However, the conclusion will become a few years later. Actually, Cortis ended up uh, uh, leaving the field of the spiral nebulae. Shapley was still confident about his big galaxy theory. Even Van Manen corroborated his previous results for seven more nebulae. But everything changed when uh, a young astronomer, Edwin, Ho Edwin Hubble, arrived to Mount Wilson to work. He was motivated to study spiral nebulae. And uh, he used the 100 inch telescope, which at that time was the most powerful telescope in the world. Mariana, so, you have a couple of minutes. Yes. So uh, in the end, uh, in 1922, 
Hubble discovered uh, that he was able to actually resolve the stars in M87. However, he was a bit skeptical. But in 1923, he uh, continued observing spiral nebulae. And by 1924, uh, he had a really extremely relevant result. He had observed a cephate in Andromeda. He continued on with his work and he ended up detecting 12 cephates in Andromeda and 22 in M33. With those cephates, he derived the distances to this uh, spiral nebulae and he found a very large distance. It was not at that moment that everybody uh, thought that uh, the, the, the island theory was correct. It took a few years in order for the people to assimilate these results. However, uh, the, um, uh, the, the piece of evidence of observation and evidence that Hubble had given us was uh, absolutely irrefutable with the time. And I think that's all that I have to say about the historical context of the big debate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Joel? Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, very quickly go through uh, a number of possible great debates that might have occurred, but didn't, and then talk about a great debate that might occur now in cosmology. So this is my list of the great debates after 1920 that might have happened uh, if, we'd, if somebody had organized them in the field of cosmology and extragalactic astronomy. As uh, Mariana just mentioned, Hubble's discovery starting in 1924 showed that the Andromeda galaxy and then other galaxies are far outside the Milky Way. And I think that settled the issue uh, of the scale of the universe, whether it was the Milky Way or much, much larger. The next big issue, uh, especially in the context of general relativity, was whether the universe is static or dynamic. Einstein realized, and other people also, uh, that general relativity was more or less incompatible with a static universe. It would either expand or contract. But then Einstein introduced the idea of the cosmological constant, hoping that uh, the repulsion of space by space that it represented could counteract the gravitational attraction. Hubble, starting in 1929, measured distances to a number of distant galaxies. And with Sleeper and others having measured their recession velocities, uh, he discovered the velocity distance relation. Uh, and we now call the proportionality the Hubble parameter, H0, the value of the Hubble parameter today. So the universe is not static, it's expanding. In the 1950s, the big debate was between the universe as a steady state or a big bang. And of course the term big bang was coined as a derisive term by Fred Hoyle to make fun of the idea that the universe started with uh, a big, explosion that has been going on ever since and making the universe expand. The resolution of this was partly the discovery that galaxies evolve. In particular, Martin Ryle, uh, really the founder of radio astronomy uh, on a big scale with the Cambridge catalogs, especially the third Cambridge catalog, which led uh, to the discovery of quasars. Uh, he really showed, I think rather convincingly that the universe uh, had evolved, which meant that uh, steady state was wrong. But what really settled it was the discovery in 1965 of the cosmic background radiation, accidentally by Penzias and Wilson. Uh, Bob Dickey and his group at Princeton had set out to do it, and they're the ones who explained what Penzias and Wilson had found. The next big issue in cosmology was the existence of dark matter. Back in the 1930s, Fritz Wicke was the first to point out that there's evidence in clusters of galaxies for much more mass than one sees in the stars. In fact, about an order of mag about two orders of magnitude more mass. Uh, that's what Zwicky showed in this very clear paper published in English. I never read the 20, the 33 paper in German, uh, published in 1937 in Aptek. 
where he also proposed measuring the masses of galaxies by gravitational lensing. He was always ahead of his time and often right. On the scale of galaxies, Vera Rubin and Mort Roberts uh, in particular showed that the motions of stars and then out at larger distances gas around the centers of galaxies, the fact that the velocities didn't fall off with distance as one would have expected if the mass was concentrated where the stars are, uh, showed that there must be some other mass, a vast amount of mass extending far beyond the visible galaxies. The problem was that the evidence was very complicated. Uh, there were background and foreground issues that had to be separated uh, in trying to measure the, the velocities uh, of groups, uh, first binaries and groups of galaxies and so on. And uh, in this paper published in Annual Views of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Sandy Faber and Jay Gallagher reviewed all the evidence throughout the several hundred papers, that is, they, they, they didn't consider them, that they considered somewhat uh, insecure, but about a hundred papers remained that really were irrefutable. And they decided that it is likely that the discovery of invisible matter will endure is one of the major conclusions of modern astronomy. And of course they were right. And that article uh, for me uh, was uh, the thing that got me really interested in thinking about what the dark matter might be. So the next big issue in the 80s was the nature of dark matter, having discovered that dark matter really is the dominant component of mass in the universe. And the Zeldovich group uh, were the leaders in postulating that the universe is dominated by neutrinos, light particles moving at very high velocities, uh, nearly the speed of light in the early universe, at least. Uh, so, uh, we called that hot dark matter. And uh, the other thing that Zeldovich and his group did was to propose what he called the adiabatic scenario, where uh, all the different components of the universe evolved together, the uh, dark matter, the radiation, the ordinary matter, uh, rather than having one grow at the expense of the others. Around that time, uh, Heinz Pagels and I realized that the then very popular particle physics theory of supersymmetry, which has remained one of the most important ideas to try to go beyond the so-called standard model of particle physics, that that model naturally implied a dark matter candidate, the lightest superpartner particle. In the particular version that we studied in 1982, uh, that would have been the Gravitino, but shortly afterward, uh, another kind of particle called the neutralino became the dominant one. The gravitino we showed uh, had a mass of around a kilovolt. Many people in those days thought that the early universe was very complex. For example, Misner's mixed master universe, Jerry Ostreicher inventing larger and larger scale explosions to move things around. But as I said, Zeldovich assumed that it was fundamentally simple with a scale-free spectrum of adiabatic fluctuations, first of baryons, and then as the cosmic background radiation uh, measurements became more precise and uh, fluctuation amplitude and the temperature of 10 to the minus four was ruled out. It had to be smaller than that. And the Moscow physicists thought that they discovered neutrino mass. Uh, Zeldovich and his colleagues pushed this idea of neutrino dominated universe, hot dark matter. George Blumenthal and I thought that the Zeldovich approach was a very good idea, the adiabatic approach, but we were quite skeptical that hot dark matter would work. So we first work out the consequences of this idea that I'd proposed with Pagels, and then with Sandy Faber and Martin Rees, the cold dark matter theory. And we always describe cold dark matter as particles that move sluggishly in the early universe, which was of course a call out to the banana slugs which are uh, the uh, motto of University of California at Santa Cruz. So uh, this was our warm dark matter paper, following up on the paper by Pagels and me, where we showed that the genes mass in uh, a universe where the dark matter particles had a mass of about a kilovolt would be about 
10 to the 12 solar masses, the mass of a typical spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. That inspired Jim Peebles to propose that the mass might be considerably larger than that, although he repeated our point that uh, if the mass were of the order of a kilovolt, then you would naturally explain the origin of galaxies like the Milky Way. Uh, one of the key references in this paper, you can see it there uh, right in that first paragraph, is uh, our paper, Blumenthal, Pagels, and Primack. And in fact, uh, George Blumenthal was the referee of this paper. George and I realized that it contained uh, at least two problems. The calculations weren't right, and uh, he had left out the neutrinos in particular, which are at least half the uh, radiation, which was the dominant form uh, uh, in the early universe. Uh, but nevertheless, the key idea of the paper that uh, the dark matter might be much more massive is uh, uh, absolutely critical. So the paper was accepted and published. And it was this paper together with uh, Peebles' leadership in developing the ideas of modern cosmology that led to his getting the Nobel Prize last year. So I was asked to explain the key idea of cold dark matter and uh, George and I published uh, this diagram in the upper left corner in 1983. And then uh, I included it in the lectures I gave, uh, the Verena lectures in 1984, which were widely circulated. Uh, so what this shows is that this is the scale factor of the universe, one over one plus the redshift. So this is today, uh, this is back at redshift of nine. Uh, so back a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And as you go back further, you go back to hundreds of thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and so on. Uh, as the universe gets older, it uh, encompasses, the, the uh, size of the universe gets bigger, the, the uh, uh, horizon, and it encompasses larger and larger mass scales. So uh, on the vertical axis is the amplitude of the fluctuations, delta rho over rho, and uh, if the fluctuations are scale invariant, then the amplitude will be the same as each scale comes inside the universe, 10 to the six solar masses, 10 to the nine solar masses, 10 to 12 solar masses. And that's what's predicted by the simplest versions of cosmic inflation. And the modern picture is very close to that, not, not exactly, but very close. And the key idea is that fluctuations in matter that come inside the universe, that come inside the horizon, when the universe is radiation dominated, don't grow very much. You see how they flatten out here. Only those that come inside when the universe is dominated by matter grow as fast as possible, which is proportional to the scale factor A. So you see these straight lines. And the switchover occurs on a uh, mass scale of around 10 to the 15 solar masses, the mass of a giant cluster of galaxies with its dark matter halo. So this piling up of fluctuations on 10 to the six, nine, 12, and so forth uh, causes this flattening of the power spectrum of fluctuations in the cold dark matter picture. And then on larger scales, beyond about 10 to 15 solar masses, uh, the curve becomes much steeper. And that's indeed exactly what's observed if you look at the distribution of matter on the large scale in the universe. So we published this idea, working out the implications for structure formation in the universe galaxies, clusters, and so on, and comparing it to the data that was just becoming available from the first CFA survey of a few thousand galaxy uh, redshifts. And we concluded that the theory seems to work. It has tremendous predictive power. The post-recombination fluctuation spectrum is calculable. It governs the formation of galaxies and clusters. Good agreement is obtained for a Zeldovich spectrum of primordial fluctuations. We concluded that a straightforward interpretation of the evidence favors a low matter density universe, kind of the, uh, about uh, uh, omega matter of 0 0.2 in the cold dark matter picture, but we couldn't rule out omega equal to one. Of course, uh, a lower omega together with inflation uh, implied that most of the rest would be something like hot dark, like uh, uh, dark energy. So, this is the conclusions. And uh, what we showed was that the theory really looked like it might make sense, that it seems consistent with the observations of large scale clustering, including superclusters and voids, 
the best model available and merits close scrutiny and testing. And of course, it became the basis for the modern picture. The next big question was, uh, so what is it? A low omega universe or omega matter equals one. And if it's a low omega universe, uh, is there dark energy? And of course, Saul Perlmutter and working together, Brian Schmidt, Adam Reese, each of them leading uh, teams, measuring the distance to uh, supernovae, using supernovae to measure the distance, type 1a supernovae, uh, and uh, making the distance redshift connection, uh, they discovered that the universe expansion was actually accelerating. And uh, they got the Nobel Prize uh, soon after this uh, for having made this remarkable discovery that settled this issue of dark matter versus uh, dark energy. Uh, a debate that still goes on, although I think it's more or less resolved, is small scale issues, in particular cusp four or too big to fail. Uh, I don't have time to go into that. So let me just talk about what I think is the big issue today. And amusingly, it's the scale of the universe again. Although now the issue is whether the Hubble parameter is 67 versus 73 both of course in the standard units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. So the evidence for cold dark matter with the cosmological constant is very strong. Uh, the agreement with observations is absolutely spectacular, both for the cosmic background radiation and the distribution of galaxies. This is the uh, latest data uh, from the Planck satellite, the final data release. And the blue curves are the predictions of Lambda CDM, uh, there's six adjustable parameters. They were known uh, more or less before the data was available from these extremely precise measurements, but uh, only a little bit of adjustment was necessary. And one gets these incredibly uh, accurate predictions. The blue curves are the predictions. The red dots are independent measurements. And they really agree fantastically well. But there's a problem. The problem is that if you use the cosmic background radiation to measure the expansion rate of the universe today, the Hubble parameter today, you get 67 with a very small uncertainty of plus or minus 0.4. If you do it with nearby measurements, several different kinds of nearby measurements, you get 73 with an uncertainty of about one. The difference between 73 and 67 is about six sigma. One does not expect that kind of difference to be due to any sort of uh, random fluctuation. I think the universe is trying to tell us something. Of the various ideas that have been proposed to try to resolve this discrepancy, the one that seems to me physically most plausible and also that seems to work the best is early dark energy, a brief period of about 5% extra dark energy at a redshift of around 4,000, about 30,000 years after the Big Bang. So how does that work? Here again on the left-hand side is that same picture uh, from a review by uh, Lisa Verdi. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I'm showing you the story, both the standard Lambda CDM, that's the dash curves, and the version with a short episode of dark energy contributing just a little bit of density to the universe uh, at around a redshift of 4,000. So what you see is that the standard picture has a contribution of dark energy that rises only in the fairly recent universe, the uh, curve that's rising rapidly uh, right here. But flat here, and of course, a huge amount of dark energy uh, at the very beginning of the universe with the uh, inflation. Uh, if the dark energy is due to a scalar particle that's not at the minimum of its potential, it naturally will decline very rapidly. That's what happens in cosmic inflation. And that's a plausible story about how it might happen at this early epoch. Uh, to get a really good fit to the cosmic background radiation, it helps to have these wiggles. So, uh, but notice that the total contribution to the cosmic density is really quite small and it only lasts for a short period. Of course, that does cause 
uh, a little bit lower amount of radiation than matter because now the dark energy, just a, the uh, transition from radiation dominance to matter dominance uh, is making this small contribution. So uh, this was worked out analytically by several different groups, in particular, uh, Mark Kamienkowski, uh, uh, Poulin, and uh, Smith. And we followed uh, and worked with them. And our contribution was to work out the cosmic, uh, the, the effect on the cosmic fluctuation spectrum of uh, nonlinear uh, evolution. Uh, the formation of, of structure in the universe, galaxies and clusters and so on. Yeah, do you have a minute to rest here? Yeah, I'm just finishing. So that's done together uh, using uh, N-body uh, methods. And what we discovered was that the predictions for the present day universe are within a couple percent of standard Lambda CDM. But if you go back to Redshift 1, you find that the theory predicts 50% more clusters of galaxies than standard lambda CDM. As you go back to earlier times, you get an increase of a factor of several in the number of galaxies. Uh, and these are things that should be detectable on a fairly short time scale. For example, the EROCETA satellite is in the process now of making a census of 100,000 uh, clusters of galaxies. And uh, we'll soon be able to tell whether there's this larger number at redshift one. So, I've now repeated my list of uh, these topics. Were these debates worthwhile? And the answer is that these debates can clarify the issues, but in no case were the debates that were occurring in the field able to actually settle any of the issues without new observational data. The new observations are what settled each of these debates. And that's what we're counting on to settle the debate about whether the scale of the universe corresponds to a Hubble parameter of 67 or 73. Incidentally, uh, the 73 corresponds to a universe that's only 13 billion years old, not 13.8. Anyway, I'm assuming that new observations are going to settle all of the issues that we've raised. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you to all participants. So I prepared a couple of questions that we can um, discuss uh, with the uh, speakers and also the people um, in the audience can participate. Just raise your hands in the, in the Zoom. So um, actually <laughs> the, the two questions, uh, uh, you all already approached them, but I will, uh, <laughs> I will, discuss, uh, I will discuss them in, in any way. So let me start with the first one. So the scientific communication in, circun in circumstances in 1920 were somewhat different as they are now. Mm -hmm. Communications time scales were much larger. The scientific community was much smaller. And the amount of scientific information was even smaller than today's standards, no? <laughs> so in our modern context, is it really possible to organize a great debate that will have a, such a great impact to the point that will change our understanding and the nature of the universe? And what is the importance of having these great debates in scientific development? Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Mariana, Vladimir, or Joel? Well, I, I already said uh, that my own feeling is that great debates may be helpful in clarifying the issues, but they aren't gonna resolve them. It's only new observational data that can resolve them, or in the case of uh, physics uh, or chemistry, new uh, laboratory measurements. Uh, uh, theorists can propose many different ideas, and if we're doing it right, we can make assumptions and then work out correctly the consequences of those assumptions. But we cannot say what's true. Only the data tells us what's true. Okay. Um. Vladimir, Mariana. I think um, Sandy is raising their hand. Oh, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt the, the no, no, please, uh, official okay. participants. Please go ahead, Vladimir. No, no, please. No, 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 I, did, I didn't see that you raised your hand. So please, Sandy. Uh, I didn't see how to raise it by computer. I now do, so uh, I'll oh. do it the right way. Okay. Um, 
I, it just, I was just thinking that there is a great debate and it will not be resolved by new observational in, uh, evidence because it is of a different nature. And I think it is actually the critical debate right now. And that is why do we care about these things? <laughs> and why is this information important for the human future of the human race? Obviously it's important to astronomers, but we are an expensive science and despite, and, and, and we cost a lot. Nevertheless, we're very lucky. People are very interested in what we do. Why, why do they care? And how does this big picture, how is it gonna impact important decisions that are being made globally, worldwide, that will affect future generations over maybe even cosmic time. So I think that's the debate. Why are we important? Okay, <laughs> thank you. David? Mariana is raising Mariana the hand. Is hand. And then after them. Okay, Mariana. Okay, um, I will try to start my video and see if I don't lose the connection. Um, so the way that I see it is that these big debates act as catalysts in order to motivate the scientists to try to propose new observing programs or try to propose new uh, observational experiments in order to try to look for the answers. So I agree with Joel that the debates do not solve anything. We just saw it with the 1920 debate. It didn't solve the, the, the question, the burning question right there, but it I think it, the debates can act as catalysts. And I think that's why they may be important. Of course, now is, everything is different from uh, 100 years ago. Now we do not need to set, um, to, put, to, to select two persons and in one specific place in order for them to debate. Now we have the conferences, for example. So we can have big debates there. And if we, can, if we plan uh, our conferences well enough, we can have great debates there. And I think that's why we go to conferences right now, in order to be motivated to uh, ask ourselves new questions and try to answer them uh, for us observational, uh, in, in order to try to think, what can I do as an observer in order to try to uh, answer these big questions or these burning questions? So that's what I wanted to say. And I do agree a lot with, just, with uh, what Sandy just said. Uh, we are living in a very different uh, world than, uh, that, than the world that was uh, alive 100 years ago. Uh, the way that uh, people see science, and especially a fundamental science like astronomy, it's uh, extremely important for our own growth as scientists. So I think that is a very, uh, a very important issue that Sandy just raised. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let me. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that the great debates in science are useful because they provoke and lead the community to think about fundamental problems or unsol unresolved issues. Uh, and the resolution of these issues can lead to new discoveries and paradigms. Uh, the important thing, I think, in this debate is that they do not become a passionate and leading fight between egos or because of personal interest, as sometimes happens. Uh, the, so the debates, while not at the level of personal or group interest, I think stimulate in a playful way uh, the focus on fundamental problems. They stimulate the discussion, and, and, the, uh, uh, and, and I think this is very important, especially in these times where science is too fragmented. And following uh, the, the uh, Sandy's uh, uh, point of view, I completely agree. I think that uh, uh, we, we, as scientists, we should go a step further and even to, to, to try to, to put our uh, research, our results in a more global context, in a philosophical, social uh, context, especially in these times of global things. So I think that a key point now is how scientists can combine society, that science is useful, that science is a way to uh, progress, to advance as as a, as a, uh, as, a huma as humanity. So this is my point of view. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, the next question, um, and it was actually more <laughs> in the direction that you already started to uh, uh, discuss, but. Uh, 
uh, I think it was m my original question was more related to um, to the last part of Joel's uh, discussion. So uh, let me put it and then you can decide whether you want to discuss it in this context or not. So the question about the scale of the universe is remarkably modern as it was in 1920. The central question then <clears throat> was if the universe was composed of only one big galaxy. Are we ready for our next great debate? What will be the central question now? And who will be the two leading astronomers debating our current understanding of the, of the nature of the universe. Okay, so who wants to go first? Um, I don't know, I just uh, following uh, Joel's, I think that uh, a very, very uh, interesting uh, question today, at least in our field of cosmology, stagnatic astronomy, <coughs> is the one about the Hubble constant uh, value, this discrepancy. So this is telling us uh, uh, about a very, you know, typically the, the, revolution, the, the change of paradigms begin with this uh, small, sometimes with this uh, small but persistent uh, inaccuracies uh, or, or, or uh, difference in observations. So observations are telling us two different values for this uh, cosmological constant and uh, this probably uh, is if it's not a problem with observations that is not yet is cladded but I think day by day we are convinced that this is real so this means that uh, there are that, that there is place for for, for, for uh, uh, possible new theories about uh, as already for example Joel was telling the early dark energy proposal but there are many others proposals and I think that we are probably in the verge of uh, an, a, 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 a new uh, understanding, a, a new model probably for, for, for cosmology. I don't know, what do you think about this, Joel, Sandy, or anything in the... Well, uh, if you want to have examples of people who might uh, discuss this, Adam Reese has been uh, very articulately uh, proclaiming that the Hubble parameter is about 73. Uh, and uh, he would be uh, one example, at least, of uh, an excellent person to present that uh, viewpoint. And uh, Tommaso Treu uh, could be another example. Uh, George of Stathew uh, has been debating with Adam Reese and others, uh, representing uh, the 67 uh, value. And he's a, a, a theorist who certainly understands what many of the other issues are. So it wouldn't be too hard to find examples. Uh, let me respond briefly to Sandy's uh, remark. Uh, I completely agree with Sandy that uh, the issue of uh, uh, how uh, the development of our picture of the origin and evolution of the universe affects uh, humanity is a fundamental question. Uh, What's happening is that we are creating the first creation story for all of humanity, in fact, for everything, that might actually be true in the sense that uh, it will continue to be the same story for the indefinite future. And the reason is that it's based on observations. We still lack many of the details, but uh, I think we're making a huge amount of progress. Civilizations in the past have usually coalesced around a creation story that says how people fit into the larger picture, what our role is. One of the things that the world desperately needs is a universal story that we can all agree to and that will help us solve the big problems like the climate catastrophe. And uh, maybe our creation together throughout the world, all scientists working together in astronomy on the fundamental creation story can help to unify the world around a common story. We desperately need that. Clearly in the United States, we need that. And also worldwide, we need that. And if astronomy can help, that would be fantastic. My, my wife, uh, Nancy Abrams and I argued this in our book, The New Universe and the Human Future. That was based on our uh, Terry lectures at Yale. So that's, that's a possible answer. Uh, Thank you, Joe. Um, 
somebody else. <laughs> Sandy, raise your hand again. Sandy, please. Back to astronomy, um, I would say that there are going to be two great debates. One is, is Earth rare? And the next one is, are there other universes? Okay, yeah, I, I said that that um, the, the conferences, uh, uh, following the conferences from the 1920 Great Debate, uh, commemorating the <clears throat> 100th year of the Great Debate, they did a conference of how uh, of, of uh, about life in the in the universe. So it's very related to what you <laughs> what you said, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's it's interesting. We, we have like these two point of views. So whether you wanted to approach it like, uh, um, I don't know, like a, the classical science uh, science question, hard question, like is the uh, about the scale of the universe? Are we uh, uh, ready to, or do we have a a good uh, cosmological model, or more philosophical, like what is what is our place in the in the universe? And, and I think this. These two are like the relevant question right right now. Right. Uh, let me jump in again uh, very briefly and just mention that a new paper was just published today. Uh, Francis Nimmo was the first author. I'm the second author. Sandy's the third author, I think. Uh, and Enrico Ramirez Ruiz and Mohammed Zafarzadeh are the other two authors. And uh, in the paper, what we show is that there's a new way that Earth is special, a Goldilocks planet having just the right amount of uranium and thorium to provide enough heating that the earth is geologically active and has plate tectonics, but not too much to destroy the earth's magnetic field, the dynamo that creates the magnetic field. If you increase the amount of uranium and thorium by just a little bit, you wreck the dynamo. If you decrease it by just a little bit, you have a dead planet that doesn't have uh, a lot of geological activity, no plate tectonics, for example. Both plate tectonics and a magnetic field may be necessary for the evolution of complex life. So uh, this is a new discovery, uh, and it, it is related to the astronomical discovery three years ago, based on uh, the LIGO-Virgo detection of gravity waves from merging neutron stars that showed that vast amounts of our process elements, the heavy elements like uranium and thorium and gold and platinum and so on, are produced mostly in these rare events like merging neutron stars. And that means because these events are so rare that the uh, amount of these heavy elements like uranium and thorium is going to be quite different in different forming planetary systems. So uh, Francis Nimmo uh, took out his old models and just tried varying the amount of the uh, uranium and thorium, the two long lived radioactive elements, and uh, found that there are really dramatic differences if you just change them by a factor of two or three, which is the range of the observations. Turns out that europium, which is uh, easier to detect in the spectra of stars, can tell you how much uranium and thorium there are. And uh, so uh, we're now proposing that measurements of europium be taken into account in looking for uh, signatures of life, for example, in the atmospheres of exoplanets. Okay, so that's very interesting. I see that Arturo Gudinha uh, raised his hand. Please, yes, please. hello, good morning. Uh, I'm working, I'm, I'm coming from uh, philosophy, the philosophy field, I'm not an astronomer. I'm working with uh, Dr. Valenzuela, Octavio Valenzuela in a, uh, thesis about ontology and cosmology. And I wanted to answer or try to answer the, the question posed by, by uh, Dr. Sandra Faber. And why is astronomy important? From the standpoint of philosophy, uh, astronomy is, is expensive indeed, but war is expensive as well. And there, there is war all around the world. So, <laughs> so I think most of humanity, humanity do not concern about how expensive astronomy is, but the, we concern about how war is expensive. On the other hand, <laughs> this connection between philosophy and, and cosmology is not new. In the ancient Greece, 
Aristotle uh, talk about the uh, motionless motor, uh, or Heraclitus, Heraclitus talked about fire, and there is a there is an opinion from Werner Heisenberg, who said that if we substitute the word fire by the word energy, the the whole uh, Heraclitus uh, conception would be uh, completely uh, uh, applicable to the current date. So this sense of uh, explora exploration and curiosity that was born in the ancient Greece is still still alive, I think. That's why astronomy is still important. We, we are still curious as a species, and we like to explore. And uh, t talking about what Mr. Joel Primack said, that uh, uh, we need a universal story to, 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 to rely upon. Uh, this is, it has some relationship to the philosopher Kant, that what he said that we have to answer four questions. What can we know? What can we expect? What should we do? And what is the man? So what can we know and what can we expect is a, a very, a very well answered. Well, it's an, a, there is still been answering by astronomy. So if we answer these two questions, what can we know and what can we expect from our nature, the universe? Then maybe we could be ready to answer the next question. What should we do in terms of ethics, in terms of behavior, in terms of uh, helping each other, in, ter in terms of not destroying ourselves. So I think this, this is relevant to the study of, of astronomy and, and relating it to philosophy, that if we are confident enough of what, of what is the universe is, then we, we could be confident enough about how the future of our very fragile uh, planet could, could, could be. That's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David Cook? Yes, I'd just like to make a slight revision to, I think, a rather anthropomorphic view that somehow Earth is special. I would like to expand that to the broader question that many people ask, are we alone? The alone in the sense that are there consciousness elsewhere? And we don't know the range of life. And so whether there's whether we find Earths and stuff may be irrelevant. If in fact, let's say there are at least a hundred other possible environments in which the intelligence can, can evolve, in which case many of these questions, even war become, of course, very important because our long-term survival may be dependent upon a broader society uh, in which we are participants or do we then enter battle mode for our own survival, maybe species of our kind, let's say carbon-based rather than silicon-based. So I just wanted to expand it out. Nothing wrong with what others have said, but just change it from is earth rare rather than is consciousness rare? I think that'd be a more interesting question for a million year time scale. Okay, uh, Octavia. Uh, okay, okay, the connection is okay. Thanks uh, to all the participants. I guess it's quite very interesting this. I would like to come back to the Hubble uh, parameter uh, tension. Uh, as Brian mentioned that if the observations confirms that there is actually a tension. I'm not an expert, but I would like to ask to the panelists, uh, could you say a few words about how robust do you believe is, is the uh, uh, observational evidence for these tensions? Is there the possibility of a systematic or any, which is the statistical meaning? I guess it's at the level of four sigma or even, even more, but can you say something about it? And, also, I would like to ask you about some people is mentioning that there should be also a tension between the amount of clustering, sigma A, uh, based on CMB and Planck results and clustering a lower redshift. Is that connected with this tension or is, is that another uh, observation that is pointing maybe for new physics? Can you comment something about it? Well, probably you you can answer. <laughs> well, I hesitate to uh, uh, keep uh, commenting. Uh, if there isn't anybody else who'd like to uh, discuss these uh, very interesting questions that Octavio just raised, uh, I can make a brief comment. So uh, I tried to say uh, when I presented this uh, story that the evidence is really striking that uh, the local measurements are giving numbers that are around 73. 
there are many different measurements. They're based on many different ideas. The cosmic distance ladder only figures in some of them, not all of them. For example, uh, the Tommaso Trejo group used uh, the time delays in multiply lens quasars and got the same answer. Uh, so uh, I think it's unlikely that there's any common systematic uh, in the nearby measurement of about 73 for the Hubble parameter. And uh, there's no question that standard lambda CDM fit to the cosmic background radiation, but also to other early universe data like uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, is giving us uh, the 67 value. So I, I don't think that uh, that's likely to be any kind of systematic. I think it's really a, a problem uh, that new physics uh, is gonna need to deal with. Uh, as to the sigma eight tension, that's much more complicated. Uh, it's mainly uh, small scale measurements uh, of, uh, on the scale of uh, a few megaparsecs of uh, gravitational lensing uh, distortions of background galaxies, in other words, uh, weak lensing, uh, that are giving systematically low values for, uh, for example, sigma eight, the uh, fluctuation amplitude in linear theory on the scale of eight H inverse megaparsecs. Uh, however, the way that the observations are interpreted uh, may come into that. Uh, as far as uh, the question of whether these are two separate uh, challenges to the theory or whether there's some relation between them. Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, the early dark energy story resolved the sigma eight tension as well as the Hubble tension. It doesn't, but it doesn't make it any worse. Uh, the, the value of uh, S eight, which is what uh, the experts like to quote rather than sigma eight is essentially identical uh, in the early dark energy story and standard lambda CDM. It's a tension somewhere between two sigma and four sigma, depending on how seriously you take uh, all the different uh, measurements of uh, weak lensing. However, uh, there are other measurements that, uh, other analyses of the weak lensing data that don't do it the same way, the same rather simplified way that uh, most of the weak lensing papers do, where they use halo occupation distribution, for example, uh, that don't find uh, an anomaly. There have been a number of recent papers, including uh, by uh, Tristan Smith and uh, Poulan and others, uh, that uh, have contended that, in fact, uh, early dark energy may be fairly consistent with uh, the weak lensing values. Uh, if you, if you look at, uh, uh, well, I, I could send you a bunch of papers that are relevant to this. Uh, let me also mention that there are many other ways of measuring uh, sigma eight or S eight. One of them is the abundance of clusters of galaxies. And there's a recent paper uh, that Anatoly Klippen and uh, uh, Jillian Wilson are co-authors of uh, uh, that uh, contends that uh, a recent unbiased measurement of clusters of galaxies strongly supports the higher value of sigma eight, uh, about 0.81 or 0.82, uh, that comes from uh, the cosmic microwave background and other measurements, and disagrees with the lower values, uh, set 0.78 or something like that, that comes from uh, weak lensing. It's a complicated story, uh, so I hesitate to get into any more details <laughs> in this kind of conversation. Okay, so maybe systematics uh, thing to explore. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know if there are more questions in the audience or the participants or anybody wants to add something to the discussion. Sandy's hand is raised, I see. Yes, it's, Sandy. It's a question for you, Joel. Aside from early dark energy, what are the other leading explanations for the Hubble tension to explain it? Uh, there's a beautiful review uh, by Lloyd Knox uh, and a colleague uh, from University of California, uh, Davis. Uh, and they discuss half a dozen at least uh, other ones. Uh, so other examples include uh, adding uh, extra species of neutrinos. Uh, and uh, there are various other complicated schemes that people are invoking. Uh, and 
the, the Lloyd Knox uh, review concludes that uh, they all look pretty implausible and the least implausible, that's the way they refer to it, is early dark energy. Uh, and the reason I like early dark energy is that it's physically so easy to implement. Uh, there's no fundamental reason where there couldn't be more scalar fields that didn't uh, happen to be in the early universe at the minimum of their potential energy. Uh, in the earlier early universe, they would have been completely irrelevant because the amount of dark energy that they contribute is negligible compared to the high density of radiation in the early universe. As the radiation switches over, as dominant switches over to matter, uh, and the amount of radiation, of course, uh, the, the density contribution falls as one over the scale parameter to the fourth. Uh, suddenly, uh, this extra contribution of dark energy can become important. And at the same time, there's very strong pressure uh, physically to make it go away. So the, the, the particle physics uh, tells you that the potential will very quickly go to zero and the dark energy disappears. So uh, it's, it's very natural that such a thing can happen. And in fact, uh, my former graduate student, Kim Grice, pointed out back, I think in uh, 2002, that there's no fundamental reason that there couldn't have been several episodes of dark energy. Uh, and uh, I think that inspired uh, Mark Hamminkowski to look into the possibility that such an uh, early episode of dark energy could have solved the uh, uh, Hubble parameter tension. Uh, so that's why I like it. And if you want to know more about the other alternatives, I recommend the review by Lloyd Knox. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, uh, Vladimir. Uh, and, just hmm. to, to close this about this question, um, uh, I think, yeah, the, the tension, the, the Hubble constant tension is really a tension, uh, observational, which is motivating. Uh, motivating theoretical uh, efforts to, to solve it, I think also. It, it should be solved, of course, observationally, but is already at the level that uh, we need already to, to see for theoretical solutions, for example, like the early dark energy that Joel mentioned it. But I think in, more, in a more general sense, we have a very big question in front, the one about what's, what is dark energy, you know? as, as well as what is dark matter. <laughs> These are the most general questions I think that uh, we are struggling in these times, and, 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 and I think these are the key questions in, in not only in astrophysics, but in, in science in general. Mm -hmm. Mariana? Yes, uh, Martin, a question I just wanted to make a comment, and is that uh, based on the Octavio's uh, question and um, uh, Joe's answer, I see that it is possible to see that the era that we are living right now in astrophysics is as we all know the high precision astronomy and i think that is extremely exciting because uh, that means that our job as uh, observation uh, as, as observers is to plan uh, um, instruments and to plan observing programs in order to try to um, answer these burning questions to the level of the highest precision possible and to interpret uh, wisely uh, our results. And I think that is extremely exciting uh, for, for, the, for, for this era because right now we have great technology and we are able to uh, develop more technology. And, and I, I think that is actually very exciting. I don't know if everybody finds it exciting, but I do. Because it not, it not only can help to solve this uh, H, uh, this Hubble tension, but also the, for example, the Corcos problem because from the observer point of view, uh, it, is, it is still quite difficult to try to uh, interpret and measure the kinematical uh, uh, signatures that you need in order to solve that problem. That, that is just what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, so if we don't have uh, more questions or comments from, from the people. Uh, so, ah, David Q, raise the hand, David. Very short, this is maybe to Joel, and that is, do you count uh, more advanced simulations as observations, or do you count those as always in the theoretical regime? This is a fundamental- Strictly theory. Unlike all other theory, uh, simulations, if we do them right, 
They'll tell us correctly what the consequences are of various assumptions that we make, but they cannot tell us what's true. They're not observations. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, so I think we should finish. And this is, uh, this exercise was very interesting. So in, um, what I noticed is that, uh, as I said before, like we have uh, fundamental questions at different levels. So as astronomers, we have our own fun fundamental questions, but, uh, and probably these are more related I don't know if the, because most of the speakers are more related to stragalactic, uh, um, um, uh, to the stragalactic um, field. Uh, our questions are more directed uh, to cosmology or uh, uh, whether there is the tension in, in the value of the Hubble constant or the as a problem or, or or what is dark energy if there is dark energy you know but as a as a full community as a humankind we have our big question so and this probably is the great debate that we everybody is waiting for you know so what is our place in the universe what is our future uh, what what will happen with the humanity here? and and all those questions that Sandy pointed out previously so yeah, so I think great debates are, are good, <laughs> but uh, every community will, of course, will have their own great debate. So, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank so, you all. Thank you very yeah. much. And Let's see think you. about great debates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's not a debate. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you.